Hi everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Mikke Vedell, and I am CTO and co-founder of Findic. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of Findic. Are any? Yeah, wow, quite a few. Considering that our main target group are uh, very young women on the countryside, so I didn't expect a lot of you to know about it. But yeah. Um, so what we are, Findic, we are an e-commerce startup. Uh, growing quite rapidly, uh, and we have been growing quite rapidly since we started uh, with our API. So I um, want to talk a little bit about that, and uh, also I want to bring up some embarrassing things that we have made, <laughs> like mistakes that we made with our API, and like what we learned from it. And uh, I mean, I think uh, a lot of you maybe work in big companies, so maybe a lot this perspective is uh, a bit unusual for you, but I think that even if you work for a big company, you can take something away from this, hopefully. Let's see if oh, this thing works. Is I... oh. All right. Uh, so, I want to explain first a little bit about our business model, because I don't know how many uh, know exactly how Finnic works, and it's not obvious from when you just view the site. Uh, we uh, have a business model where we connect around 900 merchants uh, to our site, and we let them put up products on it, uh, like you see here. Um, and basically, they put up like title and price and description and picture, everything. Uh, and we sell these products for them. Uh, we work a lot with marketing and trying to drive traffic and trying to create a good experience on the site. Uh, and we also have uh, a really strong like, bargain framing on this whole thing. Um, so that the thought is that the merchants should lower the prices when they put them up on Fyndic. Um, what else is there to say? Um, we launched in the summer 2010, so we are a very young company. Uh, and we are also very young in the sense that uh, I think the age in the office is around 25 years or something like that. I am one of the oldest ones, and I'm 30. Um, yeah, one-stop bargain shop. Uh, we work with a lot of third-party merchants, as I said. And the thing is that when the consumer makes an order, uh, we take the payment on our site, and then the order information goes directly to the merchant, and they deliver the package to the consumer. But then after that, we take care of customer service. So that's quite an advanced operation. Uh, today we are... I think slightly above 50 employees. We have 120,000 products for sale, uh, 900 merchants, as I said. Uh, we ship around four or 5,000 items per day. Uh, or we don't ship it, the merchants ship it. Uh, and uh, I think uh, last month we sold for about 15 million crowns. Um, so um, how did this all got started? And when did we start thinking about an API? Yeah, straight from the beginning. And I think that, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, the first question is, do we really need an API? Uh, and it, the, the answer to that question for us in the beginning was no. Because uh, we had an idea about building this site. We wanted to have a lot of products and a lot of merchants that sell them. Uh, but we couldn't just go to like web shops or big platforms and say, please spend a lot of time in integrating with an API. Uh, because they would just say, but you don't have any visitors or any, anything, you don't sell anything, why should we invest time in this? Uh, so in the beginning, actually, we, we created something that is a lot simpler, uh, which we call Findic Knappen. Uh, so it's, <laughs> it's a small snippet of JavaScript that uh, the platform provider uh, can just uh, input on their site and just paste it and uh, uh, on the product, product editor page. Uh, and then they just uh, exchange some information, a few fields, and that takes around 10 minutes. So then we had our first integrations. And then we started to get a lot of products into the site, uh, and we could start selling products. So that was like the starting point, that if we would have built an API and tried to get people to integrate with it, I don't think we would have succeeded with that, because we didn't have anything to show for it. So if you click that button, you just get a dialog box, and you can... Uh, yeah, put up products quite easily. Um, but of course, this does not scale very far. Um, and we didn't really expect from the beginning either that merchants would like to put up hundreds of thousands of products. We thought like, yeah, maybe we have 20 bargain products that you want to put up. But yeah, that was something we discovered. So we decided to create an API uh, after maybe one year or something. Um, and 
Then uh, the most important lesson here, I think, uh, as I've already been talking a bit about, is uh, you must minimize integration costs for the other side when you're doing a business-to-business -business API. Uh, because that is, I mean, that is all that, that they will think about. Like, what can we get out of this and how much money will it cost? And in this case, when you're integrating an e-commerce API, probably the cost will be quite high for the other company because it's complicated the flows and it should like be a part of their business in a way and it takes time to do a good integration of that. So you really need to think like who are your users? Uh, are they, do, do they use like big old mainframes and want the FTP thing upload or do they, are they like an enterprise that uh, want to use SOAP and, and whatnot? Or are they working with uh, like languages like PHP and stuff like that? Uh, and do they want maybe a REST API? Uh, so I think it's very really important to try to think like the one who's supposed to integrate. Um, and then, of course, uh, this is a mistake we have made. Uh, we haven't created enough wrappers and modules. Because uh, if you create, for example, in e-commerce business, we have a lot of open source platforms like uh, Magento and PrestaShop and WooCommerce. If we would create modules for these, which we are doing right now, um, and just give them to the merchant, then the integration cost is zero. And that's a big difference from maybe 50,000, 100,000, which it could cost them otherwise to do an integration. So this is something we're working on. I think it's very important strategically. Um, yeah, so uh, we looked at our merchants, and we discovered that most of them have some kind of PHP thing going. Um, and uh, those kinds of people usually like REST APIs, and I like REST APIs, so we decided to build one like that. Um, yeah, the usual stuff, JSON. Uh, I worked at IBM before for a couple of years, so I got very sick of XML, so I chose uh, uh, JSON here. Uh, and we, we created it in a very, very simple way. We only have like two resources, product and order. We, I, I'm really kind of a minimalist, and I try to think this way here as well. Uh, you create products, you update products, uh, and you do stuff with products, and then we create orders which the merchant can get. And I mean, that's very basic, but that's actually all you need. And we still use that API uh, that we threw together quite quickly in the beginning, and it's working quite well. Um, so that's also a lesson. I mean, it's better to create something fast and minimal that you can get out there and start using than to like, oh, we need this, this perfect API that we should plan for two years on how to build. Uh, I mean, if we would have done that, we, we would be dead today. Uh, because actually, uh, this is a curve like the first month uh, of our existence. Uh, and the, the orange line is actual sales. Uh, and uh, we, we got our first big integrations with our REST API in, uh, I think, the summer of 2011. So you can see uh, on the curve there that something happened. And what happened was that we got a lot of new products coming in and uh, a lot of sales. And that was actually, the, I think, the most important uh, point in the, our company's history because that is when we reached traction and started growing like crazy and uh, was trying to keep up with sales rather than getting sales. So, that, I mean, that was a huge thing for us. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about some mistakes that were made. Uh, this is a classic one, I think, but I think it's very important to <laughs> bring it up still. Uh, I mean, we started, as I said, uh, without an API. Um, we started building a, like a simple core system for the basic functionality of our site. And then uh, the first thing we needed, obviously, was some kind of... Uh, backend tools for our own personnel so that we can work with our own system. So, uh, uh, for example, administering orders, customer support, uh, yeah, handling merchants and products and stuff like that. So we built that on top of our core system. Okay, next step. Oh, we need uh, merchants, we need products. Uh, we don't think we can get away with building API, but we should still uh, have some kind of web pages where you can administer your products. That's, I mean, they expect to have that, uh, even if uh, it doesn't matter if you have an API or not. So we built merchant pages, uh, which are basically pages where you can upload products and manage your orders and everything like that. And then we came up with this great idea that we should have an API as well. And then we just built it as a separate unit on top of the core system. And 
right here is when we, in, we have introduced a lot of problems that we didn't realize at, the, at that time, but now we're like <laughs> struggling with it every day because uh, uh, the problems that arise from this is that um, you have to duplicate a lot of functionality and thinking, and, and both in terms of code and in terms of organization between these different parts. So, for example, in the backend tools, maybe we had certain names for certain things, and then we had maybe other names in the API because another guy was creating the API, and so on and so forth. So, we didn't have like good common names for 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 stuff, what to call things, and, and uh, the flow was not obvious. And then maybe we had different validation in the backend tools from in the API. So maybe a title on a product could be uh, 40 characters in one place, and then 50 in the other place, and this creates a real mess when you have hundreds of merchants asking questions about how to integrate with API and yeah. So what you should we should have done if we would have had the time and forethought was to build the core system, build an API layer, and then let everything use that API layer, including your own tools. Um, that way we could have uh, made it clean, we could have uh, really optimized performance on the API layer, and then we don't, we don't need to care about performance above that layer, because we know that API is really optimized in terms of SQL queries and, and stuff like that. Um, and uh, yeah, another really good thing about this is that if everything is based on the same API, you will automatically get the same names and, and data structures and everything for, for everything. And also that our own people are working with API in the same way as the merchants do would be a huge benefit. So, I mean, now when we have the system up and running, it takes a long time to get to this point, but uh, we're working on it. Um, yeah, basically a conclusion. All internal applications should use the same API as users and customers. I think that's a really important thing, both in terms of code and organization and naming and everything. Um, yeah, and as I said, uh, I think that's an important po point to talk about, that uh, the API is so central to our business flows that you can use them as a way of explaining our business flows. So, I mean, if we build a structure with like, this is a product and this is an article that goes with the product and this is an order, it has order rows and everything. I mean, that's a very central thing. And if you build a REST API around this and then uh, educate your, your, your own staff about this. I mean, it's not, it's, it's, it's not very hard to explain how a REST API works to, to anyone, basically, even if they don't know programming. I mean, why should it be a problem to explain, for example, this is a command, it creates a product, and then you need to uh, supply the information for that, and then later you can fetch that product again by issuing this command, and then you can update it and so on. I mean, everyone can understand this, so I don't think people should be afraid of trying to educate everyone in the organization about how this works, because it's, once you explain stuff like this to maybe a sales guy, they're like, wow, now I suddenly understand this whole thing, an API, oh, it's so simple, it's so cool, wow. Uh, so, I mean, I really recommend doing this. And then, of course, not everyone has simple REST APIs, but, uh, I mean, the basic idea is so simple, and I think if you just use the word and not really explaining it, a lot of people will be afraid of it. Um, all right, yeah, and as I said, very important to use the same naming conventions in the API, in the organization, in the systems, in the code. If you have a certain name in your database, let it uh, be the same name in the code and also in the API, and then it will be called the same thing in the whole organization, and then your customers will also refer to it in the same way, and that will make everything business-wise so much easier, and it will feel much simpler if everyone is talking the same language. Um, yeah, and another thing, uh, which also ties a bit to this, uh, I think it's very important for companies, uh, the m more important, the bigger you are maybe, to be very open with your API and publish it, uh, and I mean, uh, just, uh, just, just as an example, um, a few weeks ago I was investigating uh, anti-fraud systems, we needed a good anti-fraud system for our own business flows. And then I went into, I mean, the big famous websites of the tools that a lot of serious companies use. 
Uh, and the thing I'm met by is like uh, these sales videos that are really abstract and don't really explain what, how does this anti-fraud system work. They just say, yeah, we're the best. <laughs> and okay. Uh, and then I, I surf around a lot and I mean, the only thing I found is uh, it's like click here to contact the salesperson. And then I mean, uh, uh, a scenario starts, uh, starts showing uh, in my head like, okay. Uh, this sales guy will contact me in like two days, and then we will have to book a meeting in one week. Uh, and then after that, they will, uh, we will write a contract, and it will be, take a lot of time. And then in maybe in two months, we can start implementing, and then we will probably need help some, from some consultant from their side. And uh, I mean, you, 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 you don't really get inspired to integrate an anti-fraud system this way. Uh, but there are, I mean, there are better ways. And I want to bring up this example because I think it's so brilliant. Uh, this is the anti-fraud system we use today, obviously, because it was so easy to implement. And this is their website, uh, Sift Science. Uh, they have basically three sections, how it works, then they actually explain how it works. They, don't, they really explain it. And if you don't understand that explanation, they have the API documentation. I mean, what could be more concrete for how a business flow works than an API documentation? I mean, it's it's really, you, you get to know exactly how it works, how you, how you integrate with it. And then I also have a, a pricing tab. I mean, done deal. Uh, and we got this up and running in like an afternoon instead of these weeks of meetings with salespeople and contracts and stuff like that. So, I've, I mean, this is our, uh, this, this I think is brilliant. Uh, and also the service is really nice. It started by, by ex-Googlers that managed fraud for uh, AdWords. Um, yeah, another important thing, uh, versioning and communication. Uh, a big mistake we have made in Findic is that um, we've, we've already, we've, we've, as I said, we launched this very minimal API. It, it wasn't really that nice and thought through <laughs> and so on. Uh, so uh, after a while, we were like, oh, we should create a new version of the API. Um, and then we were starting to think, yeah, then maybe we should um, stop any new merchants from integrating with the old version, because then it will be more work to get them away from it to the new version. So that actually made us like tell a lot of merchants all the time, like, please wait a bit, we will create a new API, so don't integrate right now. And as you know, with IT projects, uh, when you have insufficient resources, they tend to get postponed and, and draw, be drawn out in time. So now we've been telling this to merchants for like over a year or something like that. And still we haven't launched a new API, but we're very close to it, I dare to say. Uh, but the thing is, uh, if we just would have told them from the beginning, yeah, this use this version, and then ra rather than like trying to get them to wait for the next version, just tell them to use the current one and then also tell them that it will be very easy to upgrade to the new one because you don't need to make like big changes, you can do it gradually. Uh, so that's also an important lesson. Um, and then uh, also uh, another thing we thought of as a neat trick is that uh, as soon as you launch a new version, uh, have a structure with, um, uh, with the API tokens so that you and the new users cannot use the old version, so that you can easily keep track of what, which ones are left on the old version and you can phase them out. Uh, because that's also a big thing for us. I mean, uh, if someone has spent a lot of money integrating with the app API and we say, like, yeah, tomorrow we will deprecate this version, they will not be very happy. So you need to have a really good process for that and it will take many months probably be before everyone is migrated to the new version. But if it's easy to migrate to a new version, yeah, it will not be a problem. Um, yeah, I think that's all. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Sorry, this isn't really API-related, but since you're operating like a long-tail drop shipping operation. Yeah, kind of. You could describe it like that, yeah. Um, how do you work with optimize or I'm sorry, reactivation, or does that fall on the merchants themselves? Uh, how do you mean reactivation? A reactivation of the customer. Ah, yeah, yeah. No, that's our job. And I, actually, we we try to uh, like prohibit merchants from from doing a lot of things like that. We don't like when they like send newsletters and stuff like that because. Uh, the problem is it's so easy for the uh, for the experience for the customer to get very incoherent when you get a lot of 
I mean, newsletter and stuff from, from all kinds of merchants. I mean, a very normal scenario on Findic is that you place an order and then it comes from four different merchants. And then if you get like separate uh, information from all of them, it gets, yeah, it does, isn't very nice. So we try to handle that ourselves and, and keep it together. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.